Welcome to the chapter called Land Use Controls and Property Development. We're going to talk a little bit more. We have touched on before. Remember the police powers that were put in place to protect the health, safety, and welfare. We're going to talk a little bit more about those controls and how they are used to control the actual use of a property. And it's really not there to keep you down. I know a lot of people are like, well, it's the man holding me down. No, it's there to protect your neighbor from your actions or to protect you from your neighbor's actions. Okay, so let's get started. So we're going to talk about the actual land use controls on how they can control both public and private limitations on the ownership. And if you remember, we talked back about the police powers that have been given uh, are taken from you and they have been given through the Constitution that they are allowed to control what you do. You think you have the ultimate control on your property, but you don't. In one of the police powers, we talked about zoning being one of these issues. You cannot go to your house and decide that you want to put a toxic waste dump in it because that's not fair to your property, to your neighbor's property value. So the police power is there to control what actions or activities you actually do. Those powers are given to the state through the enabling acts. Then in turn, the states will use those enabling acts to push down that power to the local municipality to set their own consistent laws with that state. So basically that's a long way of saying that it's the municipality that will govern the use of your property. And they do that through the police power. Now, one of the things that gets created is this thing called the comprehensive plan. Sometimes you are here called the master plan. The master plan is the direction or the guidance of that municipality into the future. And I'm talking, it's usually long range future. These master plans or comprehensive plans can be 15 or 20 years in nature. And they provide that municipality with the structure and the objectives to create the goals that will take into account to help it grow. And the things that they will take into account is the land use. How are we going to use the land that is currently not being used? Are we going to make it residential? Are we going to make it commercial for growth? Are we going to put some utilities in there? Are we going to put some transit information? They're going to talk about the housing needs that are there or the anticipated housing needs that may be coming with growth. How do we move the people? Are there going to be new roads built? Are they going to expand roads? What about pedestrian traffic or, or uh, parking, uh, bike paths? Bloomington, Indiana just went through a huge change and added bike paths. They're going to talk about facilities that the community may need, like more libraries, more hospitals, more fire department, things of that nature. And then they're going to talk about the energy conservation that may be needed. So this comprehensive plan, like the word it says, called comprehensive, will talk about many different things on the path of growth for each municipality. Now, notice I did not say each state or each county. It's each municipality. You may have several cities inside of one county, and each one has their plan. And that will actually run into some issues down the road because you may have a county comprehensive plan and then a municipality, and they may not jive with each other. So one of the ways they do all of these things we just mentioned was through a zoning ordinance. 
zoning ordinance are local laws that regulate how the land is going to be used, how is it going to be protected, and how is it going to be designated to make sure that it does comply with the public health, safety, and welfare of all of the people in that municipality. Things like, what are they going to permit to be used? Maybe you want your house to be turned into a toxic waste dump and there is no land in that entire municipality that is going to be earmarked for that. <clears throat> they control the lot sizes. Make sure that each house has sufficient land. Or maybe they want huge pieces of land, which you will find actually can control the population through this thing called density zoning. We'll talk about that. Types of structures. There are areas inside of Indianapolis, Indiana that dictate what the property actually must look like. They want to keep a certain cottage feel or they want a certain industrial look. So there could be zoning that deals with the types of structures. There could be zoning that deals with building heights. For an example, anything near an airport can't be over 30 feet above grade level because there has to be a clear vision of the runway. There are setback zonings. How far must the building set back from the edge of the property? And that could be important if down the road they want to put a sidewalk in or maybe add a city water. Density zoning is something we just talked about. This is how municipalities can control their population by saying we will only allow two and a half structures per acre. And we're going to do some math on that in a little bit. And then they've got wetlands that will protect natural uh, resources. So there's all kinds of zoning ordinances. It is not just activity zoning like, well, I, I can't put my... Uh, you know, car wash there. Well, there's all other zoning. They try and remain kind of flexible because while these plans are 20, 25 years, there's always stuff that may happen that they didn't account for. So they can't be a hard, fast rule and go, well, that's always going to be commercial and something happened and that road that was there did not take off like they thought it would and is not highly tra traveled. So therefore, maybe residential now might be a good exception. So it can change even though there is a plan in place. And what is that old saying about the best laid plans? All right. Typically, when they talk about those zoning, they break them down into four types. There's residential zoning, commercial zoning, agricultural zoning, and then there are it is other zoning for mixed use. Now, there's one more in there that is usually industrial zoning. Commercial zoning, when someone says commercially zoned, especially if you're talking to a commercial broker, they are talking about typically retail, office, things of that nature. If we deal with specifically industrial like warehouses, that is usually broken out separately because of the environmental concerns. So when someone says commercially zoned, they probably mean for retail or office space. Uh, if they are talking about industrial zoning, usually it's classified as industrial zone. There's also a special use, which is what we're talking about here, that may be different for things that you would find one of in an area, a government building, a football stadium, a golf course, a baseball park, uh, a park in general. Those might be special use zonings. And they control those through these things called the zoning ordinances. One type of zoning ordinance is this thing they call a buffer zone. A buffer zone is a zoning that is usually placed between 
two distinct zonings to try and buffer either noise or uh, population because and a good example would be like uh, playgrounds and parks. You might see commercial buildings and then houses and in the middle could be a city park because during the day when the city park is full, the people in the houses are gone and at work. In the evening when people come home and want to have quiet and the park is dark, there's no one there, that has created a buffer area that still keeps the commercial property noise from spilling over. So they try and do this to separate residential from non-residential by putting things like buffer buffer zones. Parks are a good example. Churches, um, libraries, schools, things that would be uh, used a lot during the day hours and maybe not so much at night, okay? There is a thing called bulk zoning. This is to control density and overcrowding. So let's look over here and talk about this. There are some uh, municipalities that have a bulk zoning uh, statistic. And let's use this Greek letter rho, and we'll go with this thing called 2.4. If the density zoning is 2.4, what this means is that it's 2.4 structures per acre. All right. So if someone was a developer and said, hey, look, I want to build 24 houses. Well, 24 houses divided by 2.4 structures per acre would tell them that they need 10 acres to build those 24 houses on. All right. That's how this density works. And that number can go down, which would decrease the number of structures, which would decrease the, the population, right? Because if there's only 10 acres available, let's work at it in a different method. Maybe this is a better way. If this builder says, well, there are 10 acres for sale, but the density zoning is 2.4, I can only build 24 houses on that. That would limit the amount of people that could be in that area because if we said, let's use a different example. Let's say we said it was five was the density zoning. Now on that same 10 acres that that builder could go, well, I build, can build 50 houses now. Well, the problem with that is, that is more people, right? 50 houses would be more people than 24 houses. Those more people may now throw the balance of teacher to student ratio off. So we actually now need a new school. Or it may sh throw off the number of houses that are capable to be covered by a fire department. So now we need a new fire department as well, which would increase taxes. Either one of those would. So that density zoning here can regulate the population so that there does not incur new taxes, new infrastructure. Maybe we don't have enough water at the water plant to handle 50, but we can handle 40. Maybe the sewage plant is not big enough. So the simple act of this builder building 24 versus 50 may be a huge impact because the uh, city sewers can't handle 50 new houses, but they can handle 24. So we use this bulk zoning or density zoning to control the population and avoid overcrowding. Now, I just mentioned there could be this thing called aesthetic zoning, which makes sure that every property or every structure looks similar 
so that you can create some kind of look or feel about an area. Um, for example, there's a place called Woodruff Place in Indianapolis. All of them have slate tile roofs and they all have that cottage feel. And that zoning requires that if you put a new roof on the house, it has to be slate. It can't be, you know, the typical three tab shingle house because that's too modern looking. Then there could be incentive zoning, which could be incorporated into the commercial world to give people an incentive to build in that area.